John, thank you for joining me today, as well as our FVP family. As one of our industry experts, you are here to talk about marketing. Thank you so much, John, for, for joining us today. Hello, family out there, and thank you for having me. Yeah, so we got to hear last week a little bit, kind of a teaser into this week's episode, which is Stripped Down Content Marketing for Success. You're an author. You have a book, which, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show. I'm really excited for you to tell all of our FVP family about our about your book, not my book, your book. <laughs> all right. Are we ready to get started with our questions today? I sure am. All right. So let's get started. You know, you said you had a, an extensive background in newspaper reporting. And then that kind of just, you said it ended, uh, did you say around 2006? That's correct. Okay. And then from there, you kind of shifted gears and you got into marketing. Yeah, it, I was a, I was doing freelance writing for a while, but it has evolved into what's known now as content marketing. Content marketing has been a thing for centuries, but it didn't really get a name until this century. So content marketing dates back to the time when John Deere was founded, the, the farm equipment company. Okay, so how do you feel that content marketing has kind of shifted from the start of back from John Deere until today in 2022? Well, I, I'll tell you what has changed, and that is we've got so many different formats now for people to consume content. We've got video, we've got social media, we've got online blog posts, and of course, there's still print products. But back then, it was just print. And then it evolved after that with TV and radio. And now we've just got tons of formats where people can pick and choose how they want to consume content. Yeah. Could you imagine back when you first started in the newspaper industry, even imagining this whole social media craze? No. I mean, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg imagined it, but I, I sure didn't. <laughs> it's like um, the newspapers, just the, the modern day newspapers, Twitter, I think. Twitter and to some extent, Facebook and some of the other uh, formats, people, I mean, I, I know people who say they get their news from TikTok, so it's just all over the place. That's a little scary, but okay, well, hey, whatever works, different shows for different folks. So speaking of folks and our FVP family, a lot of our listeners are small business owners. You know, they have small boutique gyms. Um, small personal training facilities. So how do you feel that content marketing works for small business? How you know? It can work for any, any business. So, you know, content marketing, it doesn't know a boundary as far as the size of the business. I mean, you've got gigantic companies that are, that are doing content marketing and doing it well, but you've got a lot of small businesses that benefit very much from it. Because ultimately what content marketing does is it helps answer your customers or your potential customers' questions, inform them, enlighten them, engage them, and in many cases, entertain them. So any business can use that sort of oomph, so to speak, to engage their clients and their future clients. Okay. So historically, speaking of the fitness industry, they tend to go more towards the video for content marketing. What are your thoughts on this strategy? Video is great. And I don't think most people realize YouTube is one of the biggest search engines in the world. We often think of Google as being the search engine, and it is, but other platforms serve as search engines. And YouTube, I believe, is number two now. TikTok is somewhere up there too. So you can't ignore video if that's how your customers are consuming content. Yeah, it's funny. We had a, I had a guest on uh, maybe a couple months ago, and she was kind of like a, our industry expert for TikTok. And it was, uh, and listen, I watch TikTok. I don't really make a whole lot of videos on TikTok, but it was really interesting what she had to say about if you're a business owner, how important TikTok is to your business for marketing. I, I was surprised. Well, I think you have to keep in mind who your audience is. If it's there's a certain category, certain demographic that may not gravitate toward TikTok, that may be more interested in Facebook and vice versa. You may have an audience that's really engaged on TikTok and they don't do Facebook. So you've got to understand who your audience is 
and know where they are, know where they're living, know where they're getting their information. Otherwise, you're going to miss the mark. Yeah, I agree. And it's, we also just, we're in the middle of a series that we're doing and it's a generations in the gym and Dr. Sarah Marion comes on and she, for four weeks breaks down each generation. And she talks about the research behind on what they're looking for in fitness and how to market to them. And she talked about the younger, younger generation. They're not really on Facebook. So if you're spending all your dollars and time on Facebook, you're missing a whole generation to get into the gym, which is obviously your future. Um, I have gray hair, so I'm more of a Facebooker, but it's funny. I'll, I have connections on Facebook, much younger people. For instance, one of my cousins, his son, his oldest son is 19, 20 years old, is on Facebook and we're connected on Facebook, but he never posts ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but probably posts on TikTok. TikTok or some other emerging platform that that you and I aren't even aware of yet. <laughs> I just kind of master one and then they move on to the next one. So let's talk about writing blogs. Do you think people actually read blogs? Yes, but they don't necessarily read every word of a blog post. And that's why it's important to structure blog posts the way you see a lot of them structured now with lots of bullet points, subheads, entry points for people who are skimming content and they're looking for answers to specific questions or they're looking for a certain tidbit of information and it allows them to scan it find it and go on to recipes or whatever else they're looking at that day so blog posts are hugely important because it establishes your credibility it establishes your authority in whatever industry you're in in this case fitness but you have to be cognizant of how people consume that content and chances are somebody's not going to read the an entire 1200 word blog post but if you can give them the chunk of your information they're looking for then they're bound to come back for more and maybe hey they'll read a whole blog post at some point so you can't always assume that they're going to consume all of a blog post but it's important to have complete blog posts so that you're addressing the types of questions that people are going to come to your website to get answered. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I'd love to know what your advice is on making blogging the cornerstone of our content program. I think the most important thing is being consistent with it. So if you post once a week, it may not be every Tuesday. It may be most of the time you do Tuesday, but maybe you missed a Tuesday and you do it on a Wednesday. That's fine, but at least give people some consistency. Don't post something and then, oh, gee, I'm going to wait two months and post another one. You're not going to develop a community. You're not going to develop a following if you don't feed the machine at least, you know, I'd say once a week. It doesn't have to necessarily be that way, but I think that's a good way of looking at it is that that gives people enough content that they're like, oh, what is there next week? And it's especially important if you have a newsletter because you always want to have some fresh content going out in your weekly, bi-weekly or monthly newsletter. Yeah, well, the consistency piece makes sense because it's kind of the same with social media. You know, you want to, everybody that comes on that, that talks about social media and the do's and don'ts, they're always like, hey, you got to be consistent. You don't want to put out three things one week and then you know, have two weeks go by and you don't post anything else. And, you know, then the next week you post four things. So I, I understand the consistency. I think that's great advice. What's your, also your, like your opinion on what people in the fitness industry should be writing on? Well, I actually have done some health and wellness content. And I think it's important to let people know what's going on in fitness, what's going on in wellness and giving them accurate information. Uh, when I write about health and wellness, I try very hard to back it up with scientific information. And then also if there's differing opinions, including those differing opinions, so that you're not necessarily telling people this is the way it is. If there's a difference of opinion on some sort of fitness matter, then you, it, it's really on you as a fitness professional to give people accurate information and give them both sides or what, however many sides there are to an issue. 
Okay. So I want to just rewind for a second when you talked about consistency and how important that was in having a successful blog. Could you just give our listeners some tips on what you consider is a good tempo for consistency when it comes to blogs? I think consistency with blogging, it needs to be at least once a week. That's what I would shoot for. Um, any less than that, it just seems like it's not covering enough territory. Now, if you want to do twice a day, twice a week, as long as you're being consistent about it, I think that's fine. It doesn't, you don't have to blanket the internet with your blog posts. And maybe you take a blog post and turn a chunk of it into a social media post or turn part of a blog post into a video. And that could serve as the script for a video. Repurposing content is a big part of content marketing so that you're not constantly reinventing the wheel. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I did a post about um, how much should you sweat while you're exercising or whatever it may be. And you could turn, you might be able to turn that post into a video, into a social media post or some other form of content. So you're getting a lot of mileage out of that. And you're not constantly thinking, gee, what am I going to do for a social media post? It's like, wait a minute. I just did a blog post that has some really great tidbits that would make some good social media posts. And you might be able to stretch it out over several days or several weeks. Uh, you just have to be mindful of the fact that people consume things in, in different ways, consume content in different ways. So the, it, a social media post might resonate with one person, but a blog post doesn't resonate with them as much. Same is, same is true for a video. It may resonate more if it's a video over something written. Do you believe that blogs help the SEO? I definitely think blogging helps SEO. And I think you have to be aware too of keywords that would drive traffic to your website. So it, it involves a little research, but you have to be careful with keywords because you can overdo it. And Google does not like that. Google is God when it comes to SEO. And Google doesn't like it if you've stuffed a blog post or any other piece of content with too many keywords. And in the book I wrote, I have an example where I talk about the red meat dress that Lady Gaga wore to an awards show. And I used like meat dress over and over and over again in this sample post that I put in my book to show that A, this is not good SEO practice. B, People don't want to read that. It's too repetitive and it's boring and you're clobbering people over the head with the same phrase over and over again. So it just on so many levels, it doesn't work. Okay, awesome. Good advice. So let's talk about where does promoted content sit in your strategy? I think promoted content is definitely something you should consider. Now, not everybody has the budget to do that. In promoting my book, I have done some promoted content. And it has worked. So it may not work for everybody. You may not have the budget to do it, but it's something you should consider. And I think more and more people are not necessarily seeing the line between promoted content and organic content. So as long as it's well-written or well-produced or well-created, and it has information or people, people are looking for, I don't see anything wrong with giving it a try if you have the budget. Okay, good. So I want to talk a little, I want to get into talking about your book, but before we go there, do you have any other tips, um, any other important tidbits that you could share with our FBP family when it comes to the content marketing? Well, I think one thing that they can understand would be, you know, if you try to lose weight, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but you get back on it and try again. I think there's something similar with content marketing where if you try something and it doesn't work, great, but fail quickly. Don't try to overanalyze why it went wrong. Do analyze it for sure, but don't overanalyze it and then move on to something else. Don't beat yourself up over the fact that a piece of content didn't produce the way you thought it would. If it's a type of content you hadn't tried before, maybe give it another shot, but don't just keep repeating that over and over and over again, hoping that it'll work when it, it's not resonating with your audience. I like the mantra, 
fail quickly and move on. Very good. Yep. Yep. All right. So I know our FVP family can't see us, but behind you, you have a big advertisement of your new book that's called The Stripped Down Guide to Content Marketing. So I'm ready for you to give a plug about your book and tell all of our FVP family why they have to go onto our show notes, click the link and purchase your book. Well, your family of listeners is all about physical fitness. My book is about fiscal fitness and earning money, making a bigger splash with, with content and getting your name and your brand out there. That's ultimately what the goal is. The reason I wrote the book is there wasn't a book like this when I started in content marketing. My hope is that people take away lessons that I've learned and mistakes I've made. Don't make those mistakes. Do you repeat the successes and then build upon that to build an audience and build revenue? All right, so last week in our little plug, for your episode this week, you talked about World Naked Gardening Day. Can, can you fill us in? Because I have a lot, I have a feeling a lot of our listeners, you know, they tuned in because that you piqued their interest on this. Well, several years ago, I was working for a lawn care startup and lawn care is not the most exciting thing in the world, but gardening is part of lawn care. So I was doing some research and all of a sudden I came across World Naked Gardening Day. And I was like, what is this? I've never heard of this before. Piques my interest. And, you know, anything with the word naked in it is going to get your attention. So I thought, how can we hop on the bandwagon, so to speak? It's not, it wasn't our holiday. Somebody else came up with it. So I wondered how we could jump on the bandwagon and do something with it that would create interest. So I decided, let's rank the best places in the US to observe World Naked Gardening Day. Voila. So we used you know, scientific data-driven factors like weather, humidity, sunshine, that sort of thing to come up with our list and Miami turned out to be number one. So we came out with this list, Miami Herald picked it up, then all of the newspapers in their same company picked it up. Then the Weather Channel saw it, and I did two live segments on the Weather Channel on World Naked Gardening Day. <laughs> that Who is knew? Who knew? <laughs> so wait, before your book, your claim to fame was World Naked Gardening Day. My claim to fame at that company, but I think now that it's in this book, more people are going to know about it. But the lesson here is step a little bit outside what you think you know and do the research. And if I hadn't been digging around for, I may have Googled gardening. I don't even remember what, what the search term was, but then I stumbled upon this and I was like, wait a minute, there's gotta be something here. And my journalistic sensibility kicked in and I was like, this is too good. I've got to come up with something where we can do a ranked list. And it just blew up. We got so many shares on social media and we got two hits on, on the weather channel and we got the Miami Herald and we got some other newspapers. So it, my boss was thrilled. That's awesome. I just want to know, I'm, I feel like I see a correlation between naked and stripped down, like the title of your book. Was there any inspiration there whatsoever? Yes, there was. <laughs> uh, I, I was playing off the World Naked Gardening Day because that consumes an entire chapter of the book. And I think I may have mentioned it a couple of other places, but there's one chapter pretty much devoted to World Naked Gardening Day. And I wanted to strip down what you need to learn about content marketing. And, you know, we, I go over SEO, I go over writing, telling stories, some pretty nuts and bolts stuff that people who aren't too familiar with content marketing will appreciate that there's somebody out there who's like, oh, that's what that means, or that's what I should do. And, you know, giving people ideas like World Naked Gardening Day, um, you know, it's, yeah, that may not work for somebody in the fitness industry, although 
Um, Christopher Maloney, who's on SVU, um, who used to be on SVU, now is on Law and Order, one of the other Law and Order shows. He exercises naked, so I'm sure he would appreciate World Naked Exercise Day if there were one. But that might might be the new trend for the SEO. <laughs> you never know. I mean, as an example, I mean, somebody could write a blog post for their fitness website about the dangers of naked exercise or the dangers of, you know, be not having clothes on or, you know, whatever, or the benefits. <laughs> and the, the reason that became a thing is because he did a Peloton commercial where he was naked and exercising. So like I did with World Naked Gardening Day, where I played up on something that makes the news every year, a fitness professional could do the same thing and, to, and you know, make it serious so that it's beneficial. But maybe some of the authors like, huh, Christopher Maloney's exercising naked. Should I? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, listen, FBP family, if, if you end up taking the ball and running with it and you have some success, please let us know so I can go back to John because he's kind of you were the inspiration for this, John. So we want to make sure that you know. By the way, I don't exercise or garden naked. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that with all of us. That, that was an important piece. But John, thank you so much for coming on the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks for sharing your book with us. Like I said, we'll get the link on our show notes. So our FVP listeners out there take some right to Amazon and they can purchase your book. But thanks for coming on and sharing your uh, industry you. expertise with all of us. And the listeners out there, let me know if you like the book. And if you like the book, leave a review. Hey, John, what are your three tips for successful content marketing on a tight budget? Tip number one for successful content marketing on a tight budget is use free tools. There are tons of free tools out there that can help you with blogging, creating graphics, all sorts of things like that. You don't have to bust the bank to create good content. And secondly, I'd say use what resources you have. There may be somebody who works with you who you didn't know was a great blogger or a great photographer or a great videographer. Ask around and see if there's somebody who's already in your sphere of influence, you know, the people you hang around with all the time who can contribute to your blog or contribute to your website or your YouTube channel or whatever the case may be. And I think more broadly, don't let budget stand in the way of good content creation. You don't have to necessarily have a big budget to create good content. I've done great content with little to no budget at a couple of startups and it works. You just have to put time and energy into it. Okay, good. Great. All right, John, that's a wrap.